वसुदेवसुत देव कंसचाणुरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गुरु सो जैन कीप एडमिटिंग पीपल हु आर स्टिल कमिंग इन वी आर स्टडिंग द थर्ड चैप्टर ऑफ द भगवद गीता एंड इन दैट श्री कृष्ण वॉज टेलिंग अस दैट that um all of us have a prakriti and we act according to prakriti what is prakriti literally the word means nature so we all have a nature now let me make two terms uh, uh, let me introduce two terms here which are very important for our understanding at this point swarupa and swabhava swarupa means our real nature or our essence which is the atman we are uh satchidananda existence consciousness bliss we are brahman that's our real nature and that's what we we do not know at at this point but we are trying to realize that's the whole point of um, of spirituality to realize what we truly are that is called swarupa our real self let's say our real nature real self the other word is swabhava 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 is again nature i mean it's very difficult to distinguish between the dead you know words in english swabhava would be our dispositions our personality all right let's put it this way swarupa is the atman our real, what we really are and swabhava is the personality is the individual individual individualized personality so our likes and dislikes our um, uh, individual quirks um, our um, um you know vasanas the accumulated tendencies the differences between us all of these are in swabhava these are generated from lifetimes lifetime after lifetime of experience um uh, leaves its marks on us and so uh, in in the form of vasanas tendencies desires not only past lifetimes shankaracharya in fact emphasizes the past lifetimes प्राचीन कर्म संस्कार प्राचीन मीन्स एंशियंट एंशियंट मीन्स नॉट इन दी दिस लाइफ टाइम मेनी मेनी लाइफ टाइम्स पास्ट कर्म इज वॉट वी हैव डन एंड द संस्कार आर द टेंडेंसीज विच वी हैव एक्यूमुलेटेड वेर आर दी स्टोर्ड दे आर स्टोर्ड इन द सटल बॉडी एंड अ पार्ट ऑफ दैट गेट्स एक्टिवेटेड इन ईच लाइफ टाइम इन दिस लाइफ टाइम ऑल्सो अ पार्ट ऑफ आवर स्टोर हाउस हेज बीन एक्टिवेटेड विच फॉर्म्स विच यू सी वेन द बेबी इज बॉर्न फ्रॉम चाइल्ड हुड ऑनवर्ड्स यू सी ईच चाइल्ड हैज इट्स ओन टेंडेंसीज but to that is added um, the experiences of this lifetime so parents teachers our uh, major events in life health sickness trauma all those things together they condition us the conditioning of this lifetime also so in english you can say nature plus nurture nature and nurture together they form the swabhava and um, the, the the word that shri krishna uses here is prakriti so this distinction must be clear it is true that we are atman but for practical purposes right now what we have to struggle with is our swabhava or prakriti and this is what sri krishna says sadrisham cheshtate swasya prakriter gyanavan api in 33rd verse so according to their own swabhava not swarupa swabhava people act according to swabhava even enlightened beings even enlightened beings so that accounts for the difference between different jeevan muktas in the last time i was saying that so sri ramakrishna liked jalebi jalebi so i'm vivekananda liked chocolate now why both are enlightened beings why the likes are different why the dislikes are also different yes in the case of the enlightened being they realize that they are atman sri ramakrishna of course we consider him an avatar who is beyond a jeevan mukta but even then so they know that they are the atman they are fully enlightened they are, they are god realized uh, but still when they act in the world they act through their swabhava so each jeevan mukta will be slightly different and the difference for and for them also the swabhava does not bind them swabhava is not an obstruction um, so they manifest their god realization through their swabhava it's in fact uh, each jeevan mukta is Uh, interestingly different from the, the from the other some are introverted meditative some are active and dynamic some are very devotional some are uh, embodiments of pure knowledge 
Um, so the, these differences are due to the individual swabhava of the enlightened being. In our case, our swabhava or prakriti um, is what we struggle with. It's our individualized personality. This in fact in the uh, path of enlightenment, uh, these are the resources, both obstacles and resources, that which binds us down, prevents us from progressing. Also, there is something good in our Swabhava. Something is there which also helps us. Now, what do you do with the Swabhava? What do you do now? Uh, he says in the 34th verse, the Swabhava manifests itself in our thoughts. First in thought, then in speech, then in action. Uh, mana, vak, kaya. Speech, um, thought, speech, action. So at the level of thought, it ma first manifests as raga dvesha, attraction attachment, liking, and dvesha, aversion, dislike, avoidance. And these are all, they, they arise from our swabhava, from our conditioning in this life and past lives. Now, normally we act according to them. What Sri Krishna teaches Arjuna in the 34th verse, important verse, which we saw last time, is that we act, our sense organs and our minds, they flow according to these likes and dislikes. Now, you have to act as the traffic policeman. Allow some of them and uh, divert the others, stop the others. Those which are going to take you Godward, those which are going to take us towards God realization, allow that. Let that come into the mind, nourish that and convert that into thought, um, speech and action. There are many, many things which will come up in the mind from our Prakriti, each person's Prakriti which will divert us from God realization, takes us towards the world again, traps us in samsara. Such thoughts, don't nourish them, don't let them be converted into speech and action. By the time those thoughts are converted into speech and action, usually it is too late to stop. So one must be alert. Uh, even if one can stop it at the level of speech and action, it takes so much willpower that sometimes you succeed and maybe you succeed once, twice you will fail. Whereas at the level of the vritti, at the level of the bubble which arises from the depths of the lake of uh, our subconscious, when it arises in the bubble form, if we can identify and stop it at that level, nip it in the bud, uh, then, uh, then spiritual life becomes easier. That, that's the core of spiritual practice, that skillfully replace the raga dvesha which is taking us away from spiritual life, replace it with with, uh, with uh, a holy or spiritual um, uh, thoughts, speech and action. So that's what Sri Krishna's advice was to Arjuna. You remember in 34th verse, Tayorna vasham asya paripanthino. Do not fall in, in the trap of um, Raga Dvesha because they are the enemies of a person who, um, just a minute, let me just uh, adjust the view. They are the enemies of, of those who are on the spiritual path. Right. Now, 35th verse. Up to this we have done. 35th verse. Shreyan swadharmo viguna paradharma svanushthitat Swadharme nidhanam shreya paradharmo bhayavaha. Superior is your own dharma, the law of one's own nature, though it may have defects. It is superior to the dharma of another person, though that may be, um, may be superior, may be better, you may be able to do that better also. Death in working out your own nature is superior, superior but to follow something alien to your nature, it is fraught with risk. It is risky. Bhayavaha. What does this mean? Remember what, what Arjuna was trying to do. When he was taught Vedanta by Sri Krishna, his initial reluctance to fight this battle was reinforced. He said, yes, this is wonderful. I must realize that I am the Atman, become enlightened and Jivan Mukta. Second chapter, Sthita Pragya. I must become established in the knowledge Aham Brahmasmi and uh, be free of samsara. Why should I fight this battle? Let me rather give up all this, become a monk, go and meditate, study Vedanta and do all that and that's it. So here Sri Krishna is saying, 
you have your nature your own prakriti and your spiritual life must also be according to your prakriti what you are talking about running away from this and going away and meditating and becoming a monk that is not your prakriti as a kshatriya you have a particular nature particular personality your spiritual life also should be according to your um, uh, to your personality to according to your prakriti there he says so one's own nature is better uh, one's own prakriti or once he calls it swadharma so swadharma your own dharma is better uh, even though there are defects what defects because you are a warrior you have to fight this difficult battle where your own relatives you will have to fight against them because they are on the side of evil you have to kill them it is very difficult very unpleasant and nasty duty that has come to you but that is better than trying to do the duty of another uh, he says paradharm nid swadhane dharme nidhanam shreya so you, in arjuna's case literally he may die in the performance of his of his duty because it's a battle but it's better to engage in the performance of one's own duty your own dharma uh, paradharma bhayavah uh, the performance of the another's duty is fraught with risk or it is fearful one thing to set aside right away in in today's world dharma means religion so is it ta- talking about our religion versus another religion conversion don't convert to another religion uh, better to die in one's own religion uh, following another's religion is fraught with risk you can directly translate into into something like that no that is not the meaning clearly if you see the text up to now it's not talking about this religion versus that religion at that time there was only one religion anyway because sanatana dharma alone he is talking about he is talking about your dharma your prakriti act even spiritual life has to be done according to your own prakriti um so that has a specific meaning for arjuna now um let me make a couple of points here one is mentally construct a um like a matrix you know two by two matrix so on the horizontal the rows you have dharma adharma so dharma adharma and here on this side you have prakriti your prakriti and not your prakriti so prakriti not your prakriti or swabhava not your swabhava your swabhava not your swabhava your prakriti not your prakriti that's the columns is the matrix sort of coming in your mind dharma dharma prakriti not prakriti now if in this you will get four cells so four uh, squares one will be um, what is dharma and also your prakriti then the one below that will be what is your prakriti but adharma then the other other side will be what is not your prakriti but dharma and what is not your prakriti and not your dharma also now what does it mean you know, what is adharma so what for example prakriti nature and dharma so arjuna's uh, nature is that of a warrior and his dharma is right now to perform the duty of a warrior fight the kurukshetra battle that is his prakriti and also his dharma so that which is your dharma and your prakriti together is the one krishna is recommending of the four squares he is recommending that you should do what is moral and ethical and also according to your nature so that part of moral ethical spiritual life which is according to your nature that's the best one for you to perform that he gives a name swadharma swadharma so that is dharma many things are dharma becoming a monk and going to the himalayas is also dharma no doubt being uh, meditating is also dharma karma yoga is dharma raja yoga is dharma gyana yoga is dharma bhakti yoga is dharma being a righteous householder is dharma being a good monk is dharma all of it is dharma but which one are we to perform so this is a very important insight swadharma if you see another cell just below it if you see i am keeping the matrix in your mind so what is according to prakriti and adharma so often there are many things in our minds raga dvesha likes and dislikes which force us beyond the limits of uh, morality and ethics so for example duryodhana the villain he wants to snatch away the rightful herit- uh, heritage of the, the the rightful you know the inheritance of the pandavas what is not his he wants to take it away 
and he wants to kill his own cousins and you know snatch away their kingdom why does he want to do that because of greed because of jealousy and where are these this greed and jealousy coming from from his own prakriti from his own swabhava so what this what he is doing what duryodhan is doing in that kurukshetra battle is according to duryodhan's prakriti and his adharma do you see prakriti own prakriti and adharma if you shift to not your prakriti what arjuna wanted to do was give up all these things and go away and meditate maybe and realize that i am brahman so that is dharma no doubt about it but it is not his prakriti he is moving out of the uh, the parameters of his prakriti what will happen he will fail it is very difficult for him to succeed in that way uh, then there is one more square at the bottom i am referring to that if you have the matrix in mind it will be very clear at the the other end of that matrix where it is not dharma and not your prakriti also so um, for a spiritual moral ethical person uh, who is established in ethical life so doing something unethical greedy telling lies is uh, adharma and also not the prakriti of this saintly person so now you have four four options one is the uh, your prakriti and dharma it is called swadharma another one is your prakriti but adharma your nature but the things which are which are beyond uh, decency morality ethics adharma then the third one is that it is um, dharma but not your prakriti not your prakriti not not your nature it will be difficult to follow though it is a good thing it's difficult to follow that's what sri krishna is advising against the dharma of another person though you may want to do that that may sound very nice but it is not of use to you it will not make spiritual progress there and the last one is the worst neither dharma nor your prakriti uh, so adharm adharmic and also not your nature so these are the four uh, options and in that he is recommending swadharma that is it something should be your dharma as well as your prakriti now one more point i will make about swadharma there is a way of defining swadharma um the way of defining swadharma is basically useless for us right now i'll tell you also why it is useless but at first it's good to understand what it meant in those days in um, traditional vedic society it was actually quite easy to define swadharma so what was it five components swadharma is equal to you can make an equation swadharma is equal to five components what is five components what are the five sadharana dharma sadharana dharma means general ethics truth self self control um uh, un- unselfishness all these things which are every human being should follow sadharana dharma ethical life then second is um varna dharma varna varna means in those days caste system was there so um a brahmin's dharma was something different a uh, kshatriya's dharma like arjuna's dharma was something different so varna dharma what is supposed to be your dharma in society then there is um ashrama dharma stage of life so broadly there are four stages of life there is the brahmacharya student life when you are young and then the grihastha householder life when you are married and you are in society you, are, uh, you have a career and all of that a householder grihastha then when you retire out of household life and prepare for you know dedicating yourself to spirituality exclusively that is called uh, vanaprastha literally the forest goer or forest dweller retired person so vanaprastha retired means sort of it's it's a kind of defeatist defeatist word that you have retired you're tired and you're retired out of life no vanaprastha is there is a purpose a higher purpose now the person is dedicating oneself entirely to spiritual life to god realization the highest goal of human life really your life is starting now <laughs> when you have dealt with everything else the business of life now you are moving towards god realization vanaprastha then the last one is sanyasa so when you give up everything and uh, there are no more connections with society and you you are entirely dedicated to uh, god realization or enlightenment 
So this is called Ashrama Dharma. That is the third one. Arjuna was, remember, Grihastha. Arjuna was the Grihastha. Then the fourth one is a combination of these two. Uh, Varna Ashrama Dharma. Varna Dharma, caste duty. Ashrama Dharma is your um, stage of life duty. And Varna Ashrama is the intersection of these two. So for example, Arjuna was a Kshatriya Grihastha. So, Brahmin Grihastha will have a different duty. A Vaishya Grihastha will have a different duty. A Kshatriya Vanaprasti will have a different duty. So, uh, which, uh, what is your position in society and what is your position in your stage of life? These two together will give you something. That is called Varnashrama Dharma. And then the last one is Asadharana Dharma or unique duties. Unique duties is at that point, Arjuna was a commander of the Pandava army. So, these are certain roles are there. See, you, these unique duties, at one point, you are a parent. You have accepted that role. You are a company executive. You have accepted that role. You are a husband or a wife. You have accepted that role. So, those are specific duties which will come. If you have accepted it, you have to do it. So, those roles are also part of your dharma, um, asadharana, unique duties. They will come and go. At one time, it will be there. Suppose you resign from a particular job, then the responsibilities of that job are no longer yours. You are a doctor. So, when you are in service and you are in on duty, you have certain duties uh, which come from that. Those are unique duties, unique to you at that particular time. So, Arjuna also had certain duties because of, otherwise he should not have come to that battlefield at all. So, these five together, what are the five? Sadharana Dharma. General ethical rules for all humanity, which are for everybody. Tell the truth, be self-controlled, um, do good to others, these things. Then there is Varna Dharma, uh, from your caste duties. Uh, Ashrama Dharma, your um, uh, you know, stage of life duties. Then Varna Ashrama, the two together, number four. And last one, unique roles, that is Asadharana Dharma. All together, these five together will define your Swadharma. You say that's very nice, very logical. So why did you say it's useless? It's useless today because the Varnashrama system does not work today. It does not mean much. Um, we do not follow it, and and you know also the uh, caste system has its own difficulties and evils associated with it. So practically, it is not of much use right now to determine. So, I want to know my Swadharma. Can I put it, input the data into those five variables and then let me get my Swadharma. Computer can tell me at every, any moment, what is your Swadharma? Uh, difficult to say. Um, one can take a look at one's roles in life. That's an easier way of looking at it. Uh, are you a, mem you are a member of a community? You, ha you, are, uh, you are a member of a family? Uh, you have a, um, a job? Uh, so, uh, you have certain responsibilities there. I remember many years ago, I was asked to take charge of a college. I was a young monk at that time, foolish also, so full of vairagya. Uh, what, what are you? I am a monk. Now I was asked to take charge of a college. And the principal of that college before me was a householder, a gentleman who had retired after 30, 40 years of service. So he was handing it over to me. So it was a strange tra transition. He was this 60 plus year old gen veteran teacher and it was a teacher education college and I was this absolutely young monk. I had not even got my sannyas. I was a brahmachari. So he took me and he made me sit there and out of bravado, you know, when we were talking, I said, see, first and foremost, I am a monk. All these things, principle of a college and all that, it, it is, it does not matter to me. He corrected me and a correction which I remember till today. He said, no, no Maharaj, Brahmachari, both Sadhu and Brahmachari we call Maharaj. No Maharaj, that is not right. Look at the picture behind you, you are sitting in the principal's chair, picture behind you, Swami Vivekananda's picture is there. This is Swami Vivekananda's chair. You have been put there. As long as you sit there, you are the principal of this college and you have certain duties associated. So, that you are a sadhu and you consider that first and foremost is great. Before this you are a sadhu, you, now you are a sadhu, after this also you will be a sadhu. But as long as you are sitting here, there are certain duties you cannot, um, you, cannot um, you know, uh, disregard them. You must 
acknowledge that you have these duties. That is a very wise thing to say, not just for a duty of a particular place, but every role in life. This is Swadharma. All right. Um, I think this is, these are the two things that I wanted to say now. Uh, if, if one somebody asks then, right now then, what is the kind of spiritual practice that I want to do? I am a spiritual seeker, but also uh, we are in samsara, we have jobs and families. So what is the sum and substance of all of this? The way I understand it is, that which takes me towards God is, your, is my swadharma. That which takes me away from God is not my swadharma. And that's a good principle. Swami Vivekananda gives certain other uh, associated advice. He says, that which strengthens you, accept it as truth. That which weakens you, reject it as poison. That also is a very important indicator. Is it something that is strengthening you or weakening you? That which is, that any practice, any book, any kind of um, thing you want to take up. Then Swamiji also says, that which leads to oneness and unity. That is good, accept it. That which creates division and separation, that is false, reject it. So these are indicators. That which is selfish is not your dharma. That which is unselfish is your dharma and so on. Okay. Before we go on, quickly, let me answer one or two questions. Jayant, um, there are two hands, I think. Right. Yes. Kapoor uh, used to say often that turn your mind towards God. Hmm. Uh, so, if I'm asking practically, how does one do that? Is it, for example, if I have a bad thought hmm. and turn it, is it to like something like big dish, uh, something, or what is any, or any practice, or what is a practice that you recommend to do that? Oh, there, this is a very big question. And the whole of Bhagavad Gita has an answer to that. Yes, certainly. The Drik Drishya Viveka, Panchakosha Viveka, Vastratraya Viveka, these are all Jnana practices. But there are Dhyana practices also. You have an Ishta Devata and Ishta Mantra, repetition of that. There is a surrender to God. Uh, that uh, practices are not only by our own power, but also uh, you depend upon God's power, surrender to God. There is also the practice of uh, being a well-wisher of everybody and trying to do as much as one can. So these are all practices. A routine, practically a routine is helpful. Yeah. But at a at, at certain point, if I am bothered by something, hmm. how, what should I do? I mean, it's my sabhava that I sometimes think of, let's say, uh, I'm thinking of bad things about my children. Hmm. So how do I get over that? First of all, forgive yourself. I think just about any parent gets exasperated with the children at some point or the other. So don't worry about it. But yes, all the practices will help you there. I have no time to think about these things. I must repeat, this is the time for my japa. These thoughts come and go. Um, I am asanga. Thoughts are arising and disappearing. It's not that I am stuck to these thoughts. These thoughts are an object. I am the witness. So, or my Lord alone is present. My Ishta Devata. Uh, my Krishna, my Rama, my Ramakrishna is present in my own children also. Then how can I uh, be uh, impatient with them? There are so many different ways yeah, in which um, one can overcome such things. And also be a little forgiving <laughs> of yourself. Uh, everyone, we all have limitations. Otherwise, you would all be Jivan Muktas by now. <laughs> uh, there is somebody else who has raised a hand. This is Girish. Uh, yes. Um, my question is this. Not being a Jeevan Mukta, how do I deal with today's social and political issues? I can say to myself that this is just a dream. It's a waking dream. But um, that, that's sort of an intellectual delusion. And, and, and I, because it's, it's, it's a construct that I have. I've not realized it myself. Huh. And... and and even doing that seems like a, you know, hiding my head in the sand. Hmm. 
So, so how do I find my swadharma is uh, that as relates to today's uh, issues outside in the real world? If it moves you, notice how your mind is reacting to it. If it moves you, then it interests you and you have a role to play there. How did um, Mahatma Gandhi, who deal with uh, the British rule in India? You see, uh, you might say, what, how does Mahatma Gandhi enter this equation? But if you uh, see his, um, uh, his, you know, my experiments with truth, which is an auto, kind of autobiographical, uh, he says that he is a spiritual seeker. And, you know, he says that, uh, who am I? Pe- some people think that I am a freedom fighter. Some people think that I am a politician. Some people think that I am a social reformer. But if you ask me, I am a simple man in search of God. Now, this simple man in search of God, um, his tremendous activity to overcome injustice and colonialism, was this, an, was this a dilemma that should I do it or not? After all, I am in search of God. So, I should pray and, uh, you know, always sing Vaishnava Janato. So, <laughs> no. His struggle against colonialism, his struggle against casteism, his struggle for reforming the society, all of these things were part of his sadhana. Uh, so, his being a Mahatma was not a uh, extra, uh, you know, like addition to his uh, career as a politician. He was basically a spiritual seeker. Now, you have to ask yourself, Right now, what is my duty? You are fundamentally a spiritual seeker. You are um, seeking God. You are moving towards God realization. So, how do you deal with the issues in society at your level? You must not be diverted also. You are not basically a politician or a social reformer. That's also, that's also there. So, you will take a stand according to your values and pursue it. You have to decide yourself. You have to take a call. Uh, how how much and how far will you pursue it? Uh, will you uh, go out and demonstrate on the streets? Will you write blogs? Or will you pray for the welfare of everybody? At what level will your engagement be? That's up to you. But remember, that's always a secondary thing. The primary thing is the search for God. Hmm. You have to see what is according to your nature and what feels real and honest to you. Activism is not actually against uh, spirituality. It uh, depends on the seeker. That's why this idea of Swadharma is really very beautiful. Uh, it is, he is not giving a set of prescriptions that you have to do this and you will not do that. Uh, what you actually will do in life depends upon your situation, depends upon your Swadharma. Uh, what is Swadharma? For the, if, you, if we follow our Swadharma, that is the shortest and direct route to God realization. Swami Vivekananda put it in a more modern uh, uh, terminology. He said, follow your own highest ideal. Look at the words. It must be your own ideal. It should feel that uh, this is something that's coming from within me. It must be natural to me. That matrix the, is very difficult to actually put in practice in today's life. Varna, Ashrama, it does not make much sense today. But it comes, it's coming very naturally to me. But many things are coming very naturally to me because whatever comes naturally to me, honestly, if you look at it, that's, that's my Prakriti. In my Prakriti, there are many things, most of which will not take me God, Godward. It will take me towards samsara only. So then he adds highest ideal, your own highest ideal. He did not say spiritual, God realization, nothing. Follow your own highest ideal. What is highest? You must ask yourself, what is the most noble thing? which I want really, of the, all the things which I want, what is really noble, God realization, doing good to others, you know, often see it will be usually an unselfish thing. Yeah. We will see a little more of that, in the next verse Krishna will take it up. Why, negatively, why don't people do it? Uh, so, and what can be done about it? Is there anybody else who is Jayant? Yes, Swamiji, it's me, Rekha. Rekha. Namaskar. Uh, actually, this question, I just want to follow up on that because that is a major problem that uh, keeps coming to my mind. You know, when I'm faced with a crisis, a crisis really, not a challenge, a crisis, especially when it's got to do with the health of somebody really close to you. Uh, at that time, of course, 
course, the immediate reaction, in spite of these three years of really being your student, immediate reaction is to be totally distraught, extremely disturbed. And then gradually you do through all your teachings, etc., especially mantra jab and thinking of my ishta, you come back in a sense, you tend to center yourself. Mm. And then at the same time, somewhere there is this feeling that, you know, uh, while everybody around you is really very distraught, your family is very, very upset about uh, the crisis that you're going through or that the family is going through, it, you almost get a guilty sense that, you know, you're not sharing their grief, so as to say. You're so not, I mean, you're not suffering enough. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. No, 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 the one, I understand. Uh, first of all, one must be, as I said, a little forgiving towards others and oneself also. When one becomes a Vedanta student, double problem is there. One is the usual problem of samsara. People are sick and suffering, my own health, my, all kinds of financial problems, health problems, and everybody, what everybody suffers to. I also have the same problems. That's one problem in common with everybody. But then, then comes one more special Vedanta problem. What is Vedanta problem? I have studied Vedanta, so I should not suffer. I should remain detached. Why am I not remaining detached? Second, extra problem because of having studied Vedanta. Um, so, no, first be a little forgiving towards others and yourself also. It is very natural. Until we are very far along the spiritual uh, path, until you are a Jeevan Mukta, suffering will be there, it will affect. And one must be honest about it. Look at Arjuna, Sri, Ram, uh, Sri Ramakrishna says, somebody's son had passed away and she was uh, terribly distraught, almost mentally upset, you know. Um, Sri Ramakrishna says, that's very natural and the son, the child was grown up. So, losing a child at that age, it's, uh, uh, it's devastating. Then he gives an example, he says, look, Arjuna, after being instructed by Sri Krishna, this whole Bhagavad Gita which we are reading, when his son Abhimanyu was killed in the battle, he was devastated. He recovered after that, but he was devastated initially. One must be honest, yes, we will feel that and we will be terribly upset and at a loss. Um, the, the effect of spiritual study and practice is this, you recover much, much faster. You find peace and strength even in the midst of actual suffering. Not only others are suffering, you are also suffering. But there is also peace, there is also serenity, there is also a sense of being uh, centered. That is, uh, that is what spiritual uh, practice gives. And the intensity of the sorrow will be lessened and the recovery from that will be much faster. These are things which come as like waves in life, you know. They will come. Even for Jivan Mukta, they will come. For Brahma is also they will come. Loss and uh, dishonor and defeat and failure and disease and old age and death. For everybody. But for the, the person who does not have spiritual practice, who does not have spiritual insight, who is not holding on to God, that person is helpless. That's what is called in Hinduism the Bhava Samudra, the ocean of samsara where you are helpless. Uh, but the person who has a spiritual practice, some kind, could be jnana, could be bhakti, something. It's like a, like a boat in the Bhava, Bhava Samudra, which you can catch hold of and be saved from drowning. Mm -hmm. Now next, hold on to the questions. We will go on to the um, next verse. An important verse is coming. Arjuna asks a question. Arjuna vacha athakena prayukto yam papam charati purushaha anichanna pivashneya baladeva niyojita. So Arjuna asks a question. Um, impelled by what? Kena prayukta. Pushed by what? Instigated by what power? Does a person do wrong things? Papam charati purushaha. 
a person performs something that is papa anichchanapi even if he does not want i understand you have taught it comes from prakriti raga dvesha is there and following that one may do bad things but suppose we are spiritual seekers now we don't want to do bad things i don't want to say things which i regret later on i don't want to commit sins and yet i do it sometimes why and this is this is hindering my spiritual progress what i should do i am not doing what i should not do i am doing even though i have made up my mind now my goal is clear god realization is my goal yet i make these mistakes why so arjun asked this question i think pravir babu had last time pointed out that uh, quotation from duryodhana it is very apt here so when people pointed out to duryodhana who is the villain of um, kurukshetra um, that uh, why are you doing these sinful acts why are you committing sin so his famous reply whether it's in the original mahabharata or not i, I could not find one uh, source says it's in the ashvamedha kanda but i could not find definitely it's there in a text called pandava gita so duryodhana says that um, that um, janami dharmam na cha me pravritti janami adharmam na cha me nivritti i know what is right what is dharma but the problem is i don't feel like doing it i know what is wrong what, what is what is uh, immoral i know what is immoral but my problem is i can't stop myself from doing it so he is very honest this is the central human problem uh, it's we know a lot of things almost naturally we really don't have to be taught what is right and what is wrong in many cases the sense of right and wrong is natural even little children have it even before they have been taught by the parents a lot of things which are uh, you know even the higher animals have a sense of what is fair and what is unfair what is just and what is unjust and a uh, lot of our our morals it comes from there we we are social animals so we know what is good behavior with regard to others and what is not good behavior with regard to others it's almost instinctive but we we know it but we can't follow it that is the problem we know something to be immoral we criticize it in others and we fall into temptation or fear something and we overstep the limits of dharma we cross over the lakshman rekha the limits of ethics uh, of safety within morals we overstep that and do something wrong and then we re- criticize it in ourselves also it's called guilt why did i do that why did i say that so why does a person do this now the difference between see arjun is asking the same thing and uh, duryodhana says the same thing but the difference between arjun and duryodhana is very important why did krishna teach geeta to arjuna why not to duryodhana somebody was saying he should have taught the bad guys then the whole war would have been avoided if he could have converted duryodhana into a good person then uh, what that is the real thing arjuna is a good person what is the use of uh, teaching uh, morals and ethics and spirituality to a person who is already good um here is the difference duryodhana states this as a matter of fact this is the fact about me i know what is good i don't feel like doing it i know what is bad i can't stop myself from doing it why um he says kenapi uh, kenapi what um devena hridisthitena yatha niyojito asmi tatha karomi there is some force some power in my heart which impels me in a certain way as it forces me so i do there is there is this power of desire you know uh, a want and desire and greed and lust and hatred and dislike it comes up from my heart it comes from within me and as it forces me to do so i do i am helpless here notice that no point does he ask a question he is not willing to change he has no interest in learning anything and making a change in his life he is not worried about it or even if he is worried he is not he does not think there can be any change here arjuna notice the way he puts the same fact without wanting to also people do wrong things but he is asking how why what's going on here and what can i do about it 
this is the small difference but this difference is essential when this difference is there that i want to change genuinely i want to change then only all knowledge all spirituality morality even all uh, you know to these days what is there this um, positive thinking and tony robbins and all they all become effective uh, or um, seven habits of highly effective people um, St- stephen C- covey or the old dale carnegie and all of that they all become effective they require one thing from you from us that i want to change i can't take it anymore this is not good i want to make my life better that yes must come from us then on after that all the knowledge of positive psychology uh, ethics and religion and spirituality and meditation and gyan all of these can become effective these will be relevant to us notice in the bhagavad gita first chapter krishna does not open his mouth as long as arjuna is giving lectures this is bad this is what i should do and this is what i should not do krishna is simply quietly listening he is not saying anything the moment arjuna asks a question and says please tell me i want to know then only krishna starts speaking one sadhu in uttarakhand said see the traditional method of teaching upanishads was the student would take a lot of trouble find the guru and then the guru would test him and you would have to stay and put up with a lot of testing and hard life and then only the guru would open and tell you something which is now available in every book in every library now there's nothing very secret about it now then the sadhu said aajkal ke mahatma ji to poster chapwate hain the, the uh, sadhus today referring to people like me they put up not only poster internet advertisement and all that huh? that now here is going to be a lecture on, on vedanta come in large numbers and join the lecture on vedanta so that was not the original uh, uh, method it's only when why was that that so many restrictions were there it's only to increase your eagerness to make the mind of the seeker ready and one pointed and focused so when the instruction is received teaching is received great value is given to it and we put attention to it so so many such examples are there mm-hmm. all right now what does shri krishna reply so arjuna shows his readiness notice his attitude he wants to know how can i change things shri krishna says basically the same idea which is given earlier raga dvesha are there our prakriti is there from that likes and dislikes bubble up if you don't control it you will be swept away into samsara that is the answer that's why these things keep happening in our life but he puts it in a very concise and powerful form now what is the problem and what is the solution he will tell in the next few verses till the end of chapter 3 what is the problem main problem in spiritual life and how do you deal with it shri uh, 37 shri bhagavan uvacha kama esha krodha esha raja guna samudbhava महाशनो महापापमा विद्येनम इह वैरिणम दिस इज क्रेविंग दिस इज एंगर बॉर्न ऑफ रजस रजगुण दिस क्रेविंग और काम इट इज वोरेशियस इट्स अ इट्स प्रोडक्टिव ऑफ ग्रेट सिन नो दिस टू बी द एनिमी इन दिस कॉन्टेक्स्ट इह इन दिस कॉन्टेक्स्ट मींस इन द प्रैक्टिस ऑफ स्पिरिचुअलिटी दिस इज द एनिमी दिस इज द बिग ऑब्स्ट्रक्शन नथिंग आउटसाइड so kama esha krodha esha see the problem in spiritual life in every religion they have recognized this this very thing usually it is projected as um, devil satan something outside in zoroastrianism uh, arhiman arhiman is the force of darkness in christianity the satan or in islam the shaitan there is a power outside which makes us do bad things and then each of the bad things greed anger Uh, last they are also conceived of as little demons uh, different kinds of demons and they all torment the spiritual seeker so if you read the lives of the early desert fathers in uh, in early christianity first second third century so they were hermits who went into the caves in the in the deserts of egypt and practiced intense tapasya the whole path is if you if you look at it from a vedantic perspective you will see it's a bhakti path path of devotion to god and to jesus but there are so many narrations of um, of demons 
persecuting them. They are actually physically fighting against the demons. What are these demons? What is this Satan? It is all this, in, in Vedanta this, this, they say this entire thing is our own nature. It's deep within us. It is our Swabhava, the negative forces in the Swabhava, the Raga Dvesha, which pull us towards Samsara. To make it more precise, Kama Krodha, desire and anger. So entirely within us, not outside. You can project them as, as demons, but uh, they are the demons are all in, entirely within our, our own subconscious. I went to this monastery in uh, Arizona. Um, it's a branch of the, you know, in, in Greece, there is the Greek Orthodox Church, the monastery, very, very famous, Mount Athos. Um, which is the um, mountain where monks stay. I think Mount Athos probably. So they have a branch. They have a branch in the USA. And there are quite a few monks. They are all, all um, they have joined recently. About, I think, 20, 30 monks are there. So I went and I was talking to one of them. I was in the bookshop there. And uh, this monk uh, came to the bookshop. We are talking. So he was telling me that one has to be always careful because the evil one, that means Satan, is always looking to get you. So he's always tense, ready to fight. Basically, the idea is that um, is karma, krodha, uh, lust and anger, these are the demons. Now, Sri Krishna says, in Vedanta, they are all internal. We know the problems are all internal in our mind. Before I go into it, let me just mention here, Shankaracharya suddenly he decides to, he is commenting on the verse, he decides to define Bhagavan. Sri Bhagavan Uvacha, so Bhagavan, the Lord spake. But what does Bhagavan mean? Suddenly he decides to define it. Um, so he quotes from the Vishnu Purana. Two definitions of Bhagavan. So let me just give you the definitions, just, just for uh, information. Vairagyasyatha mokshasya, no, sorry, Aishwaryasya samagrasya, Virasya yashasashriyaha, Vairagyasyatha mokshasya, Shannam bhagaiti rina. In Vishnu Purana it is said, um, Aishwarya, glory, that means all kinds of lordliness. Ishwara bhava is Aishwarya. Uh, that is the control of the entire universe. Samagra, entire universe controller is God. That is one, one quality. Virya, uh, energy. Yashaha, fame. No one more famous than God. Shriyaha, glory. Vairagya, even God has dispassion. So the entire universe belongs to God, but God has no sense of possession about anything in the universe. Vairagya. And moksha. God is the, uh, yeah, Bhagavan is the master of moksha. Our moksha is granted by, by the Lord's grace, Kripa. Shannam, these six are called Bhaga. These six are called Bhaga. Bhaga one. The one who has these six is called Bhagavan. So which are the six? Aishwarya, that is lordliness. Virya, uh, energy or virility. Yashaha, fame. Shriyaha, glory. Vairagya, dispassion. Moksha. Liberation, salvation. The one who has these six is called Bhagavan. Bhag these are six are called Bhaga and one who has these six is Bhagavan. Another definition given in the Vishnu Purana itself. Utpattim pralayam jaiva bhutanam agatim gatim vetti vidyam avidyam cha savacho bhagavaniti It says, the one who knows the source of the of all creation, Utpatti, all beings and creation itself, Pralayam and the end of the universe also. There is only one who can know that because at the time of creation only God exists. Individual beings do not, we do not exist separately. And at the time of the cosmic dissolution, everything is destroyed except God. So God is the only one who knows these two. Not only that, Bhutanam Agatim Gatim, coming and going of the individual beings like us. Our individual destiny also, God knows. So this is one characteristic of an avatar. Though we cannot directly speak with God, but we, those like Arjuna and, other, and those who are near Sri Ramakrishna, 
uh, those who are the company of avatars, they noticed this. Arjuna, Krishna tells Arjuna in another chapter we will see. He says, we have had many births, you and I Arjuna. I know them all, you don't. I know them all means not only do I know my own births, even a Jivan Mukta will know to some extent his own past lives. I know them all, not only my own births, but I know all your births also. Whatever has happened to you in the past and what will gati, what will happen to you also I know. Sri Ramakrishna says to Master Mahasha M, the writer of the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, in one place he says, tell me, I know your entire past. And he immediately, I don't know what he felt, Master Mahasha, he bows down and says, yes Lord, you know. Everything about your past and everything that's going to happen to you in life. So, gati and agati, uh, agati and gati, the coming and going of all individual beings. Vidya, avidya, realization, knowledge, and avidya, also maya, in which all beings are in delusion, both are known to, to the Lord. So, such a one is called Bhagavan. So, what is Sri Krishna's answer? Kama and Krodha, you asked what, why people do things even if they don't want to, even if they are spiritual seekers. Why do they not make progress in spiritual life? And why do they slip from spiritual life again and again? Kama Krodha. He says, desire and anger. Here also, an interesting thing, Kama Krodha 2. In Sanskrit grammar, there should be a dual number. You know, in Sanskrit grammar, single, dual, plural. So, earlier, for example, if you notice, he said, Raga Dveshau. Two things. Raga means attachment, Dvesha means aversion. So, Raga and Dvesha together, uh, two. So, he used dual number, Raga Dvesha. He says, Tau, those two are the enemies here. But here, he uses the uh, singular. Kama Esha, Krodha Esha, singular. Instead of uh, Kama Krodha, he says Kama Krodha. Why? Because both are the same thing. They are not different. Desire is the root. When desire our desires are frustrated, it becomes anger. At the root of all anger, even good anger, righteous, so-called righteous anger, if some desire is frustrated, something we wanted it to be so, it is not so, hence anger. It need not always be anger. If the person responsible or the situation responsible for frustrating my desire is powerful or is impersonal, then there will be not anger, there will be fear. So, pandemic, whom will you be angry with? You can't be angry with the virus, but fear will be there. My desire for a comfortable, safe, uh, predictable life has been totally upset. Now I am whom to be angry with, but I, I can be fearful, anxious, tense. Anger, anxiety, fear, all are modifications of frustration of desire. So, karma is at the root. If desire is satisfied, good, then desire should be satisfied. Anger will not be there. Desire satisfied is transformed into greed. Lobha. So, at the root of karma, karma is at the root of lobha and krodha. Krodha is anger. Lobha is greed. It is an intensification of desire. So, desire unsatisfied leads to trouble. Desire satisfied leads to trouble. Kama, desire, is at the root of all samsara. In fact, we are talking about it in four noble truths in Buddhism. And uh, the source of, so first noble truth, dukkha, suffering. And at the source of suffering is kama, desire. Desire is at the source of suffering. Let me make a few quick points and I will take up questions and then we will stop. I have written down some points I wanted to say about this. So, as I said, Kama, Krodha, Lobha. Um, Sri Krishna later will say, these are the, the, the straight door to hell. Kama, Krodha, Lobha. And at the root of, that means desire, greed and anger. But at the root of, of all three is desire itself. Desire is the root. Then, the nature of desire. I want something or I do not want something. If I want something or I do not want something, in both cases, it leads to suffering. So, Dukkha is directly related to that want. Want or do not want. Remove that want, Dukkha will not come. Suffering will not come. It is very Buddhistic actually this idea. Then the third point is uh, that um, 
one may ask, then what about the desire for God? Desire for moksha, liberation. I love God, I want God. Isn't that a desire too? That's also a desire. So isn't that bad? No. The desire for God realization is not bad. Sri Ramakrishna says, why is it not bad? Because that it removes all other desires. It removes the desire which traps us in samsara. Desire for God removes other desires. And he gave a very nice example. Sweets. So Bengali. Bengalis love sweets. So sweets, uh, if you eat too much sweets, it causes uh, acidity, uh, acid reflux. And he says, sugar candy, mishri. In English, it's sugar candy, or, uh, mishri. So he says, that is not to be counted among the sweets. Because if you take that, it, it combats, it fights against uh, acid reflux. Rock candy, yes, rock candy. So rock candy, if you put it in water, in fact, that is re recommended if you have stomach trouble, acidity, it is recommended as, as um, uh, something to soothe your tummy. So that's also sweet, but it's not to be counted among uh, other sweets. Similarly, the desire for God, it removes all the, these worldly desires. Uh, it actually channelizes all the worldly desires to God words. Some quick differences. Desire for God is not a desire, worldly desire. Why? Because desire for God is for the infinite. Desire for the, karma is for something finite. The objects which we want, it may be a person, it might be a thing, a gadget, it might be money, it might be some activity, job, place to stay, something. Something limited when you want it, thinking it will satisfy me, and that is finite. Whereas the desire for God is desire for the infinite. Upanishad says, Yo vai bhuma tat sukham, nal pe sukham asti. That which is the infinite is joy. There is no joy in the limited. This takes us lifetimes to learn. So we try to chase joy in the limited. We want to, why do we do that? We want to become unlimited because that's our very nature. We don't know that, not knowing our nature. So see, at the root of desire is ignorance. Ignorance of our nature. Not knowing our real nature is the infinite. We try to fulfill, try to become infinite by keep on adding the finite. It will never work. Sri Ramakrishna says, keep on adding as many zeros as you want. Zero. No matter how many zeros you write, still zero. If you put one before all of the zeros, then every zero gets value. What is that one? God. That was Sri Ramakrishna's very beautiful way of putting it. The second point is, every desire, karma is desire for anatma, not self. And desire for God is desire for the atma, for, for our real nature. Atma, anatma. Third point difference is, the desire for the world, karma, it can never be fulfilled. There is a famous verse which says, desire, if you try to satisfy desire, if you, become, if you want this, uh, to become satisfied, keep on fulfilling desires, that's what we all do, it will never be fulfilled. It's just like pouring ghee into the fire, the fire just blazes up even more. Desire keeps on increasing. You think, I will, I've got so many desires, let me fulfill them, I'll be satisfied. No. By the time you have fulfilled a few, you will find they have doubled or tripled in number. Variety. Fulfillment decreases. As we go through life fulfilling desires, actually total fulfillment keeps shrinking. I was thinking, look at a uh, child's face, you know, toddler's face, beaming, innocent, full of joy. Teenager's face, mm, cool, relaxed, doesn't want, even if he's happy, doesn't want you to see the joy. Young person's face, busy. I was thinking, old person's face, mm, unhappy. Why? The old person should be happier than the baby because the old person has fulfilled so many desires, unhappy. More desires you fulfill, the more it comes. And then this Bhaja Govindam, um, Shankaracharya sings that Balastavat uh, Krida Rakta, Tarunastavat Taruni Sakta, Vridhastavat Chinta Magna, Parame Brahmani Kopina Lagna, Bhaja Govindam, Bhaja Govindam, Govindam, Bhaja Muravati. The child is engrossed in play, the toys. The youth, the youth is in, the young boy is engrossed in the maiden, uh, boys and girls. Then the old person is engrossed in cares and anxieties and worries. Nobody is interested in meditating on Brahman. 
<laughs> Shankaracharya is bewailing the fact that after all this teaching of Vedanta, nobody is interested. They are interested in other things. Therefore, what do you do? Bhajagovindam. Worship the Lord. Worship the Lord. Fulfillment not possible. Kama, it is a, it's a wrong track we are taking. Kama. Um, whereas, God realization is possible. Fulfillment is possible. What proof? Why should we believe you? Look at the lives of enlightened people. Who, in whichever tradition, whichever religion, those who you consider to be saints, they are deeply fulfilled. They are the only ones who are truly fulfilled, ever. No matter in their external life, whatever challenges they have to face, they are internally, they are deeply fulfilled. Um, then one more difference is, um, so, not only we have desire for things, we have desire for the means of fulfilling those desires. So money is a means. So we have money to buy, buy food and houses and enjoyments. But we have desire for the means of that also. That means the money itself also it becomes an object of desire. So things which we desire in the world plus the means to get those things, those also becomes objects of desire. Whereas in spiritual life for God realization, um, the desire for God and there is the desire for meditation and devotion and service and study of Vedanta, what we are doing right now, these are also desires. All of these desires are also not to be counted among Kama. The desires for fulfilling worldly desires are to be counted among Kama, worldly. The desires for those things which will lead us to God realization, those desires are also good. They are not to be counted as worldly desires. And then last one is Viveka Viveka. Worldly desires are the result of lack of discernment, aviveka. It is foolishness and to put it in other words, foolishness, stupidity leads to worldly desires. And viveka, this uh, nitya, nitya, eternal, non-eternal, God alone is real, the world is not real. This instinctive feeling, we have not realized it yet, but this feeling is there. That leads to the desire for God realization. Hmm. Um, another simple question was, so, what are the desires? How can life go on without desire? And what desires should are to be kept or not? So, life can go on without desire, without karma. See, life depends on, um, on objects, people and your actions. Objects, people, actions. That's what life depends on. Not on desire. So, uh, the things in the world, food and a place to stay and activities to do and the people around you, your own body and mind, these are the things which sustain life. This can go on without desire. Desire is internal. The things which are, uh, which are concerned with life are there, out there. So they can go on. Law of karma will keep on giving results and life will go on. So you don't have to worry what will happen to the world if I give up all desire. No. And then minimum necessary for body. And that is uh, com completely acceptable and in accordance with spiritual life. Food, rest, exercise, even a little, a little bit of relaxation, ahara, vihara, later on Krishna will say, a balanced life. So, just because you have to give up all desires doesn't mean that you start starving yourself and not, um, not exercising, not keeping up your health, no. What one must do is, what karma does is, it takes you away from kartavya ishta devata swarupa. That means it takes you away from duty. What we have to do in life, karma diverts us from that, kartavya. Our ishta devata, you have got a mantra and the form of God you meditate on. Karma diverts you from that, takes you away from ishta devata. You notice in our own lives, this is a very important suggestion. If you notice in our own life and the self, atma, our real nature, karma always diverts you from that. So kartavya, what you have to do in life, Desire prevents you from doing that or engages you in something else. And focusing on God, mantra and ishta devata, desire takes you away from that. And being centered in your nature as Atman, desire of course takes you away from that. How do you do karma? Karma yoga is the best solution for giving up karma. This is the last point I will make. 
Karma Yoga is the best solution. What is Karma Yoga? With this physical body, notice this gross body, physical body, Stula Sharira is not mine. It is part of samsara. It is true. Notice when we say this is my body. Uh, I am cutting off this physical body from an ocean of matter which is out there. This entire universe out there. It's one unbroken ocean of matter. I cut off at this skin and say this much is mine. The rest is not me. This is false. This physical body is part of this entire universe. Your body is part of samsara. Samsara belongs to God. So the entire universe belongs to God, including this body. Mind. This mind is a part of an ocean of mind. Cosmic mind, Hiranyagarbha. Not my mind. Good and bad, whatever is there, it's part of an unbroken ocean of mind. It belongs to God. And the causal body, which is the Karana Sharira, that is part of the Maya Shakti of God. So basically the idea is, the three bodies which we have, Stula, Sukshma, Karana, Gross body, subtle body, causal body. This is what we have right now. We take hold of these falsely, illegitimately. They don't belong to us. We take hold of these and then we try to use it for our own bhoga, for our own enjoyment. This is samsara. Acknowledge the fact, these do not belong to me. They do not obey me. I have not created them. I don't um, own them. They have come to me. As part of this universe, there's a gross universe, subtle universe, causal universe. They all belong, they are the glories of God. Knowing this, now for the time being that I have, I'm in charge of this physical body, mental body, I use the physical body for the welfare of the world. I use the mental body, thought of God, thought of, of, uh, of, of you know, welfare of others, well-wisher. That I wish everybody well. Never wish harm to anybody. Because this mind with which I wish harm to anybody is not my mind. It belongs to God. Use it to be a well-wisher of the world. And the causal body. Use it for stillness. That's the place where everything is resolved in silence. Physical body for the welfare of the world, for the service of God. Mental body to think well of the everybody in the world. To wish everybody well and to love God. And the causal body to be in silence and stillness, to be absorbed in samadhi on God. So this is, this is the deepest form of karma yoga. Swami Ranganathanji put it so simply, all of this. He said, when I close my eyes in meditation, I find peace within. Causal body, stillness. When I open my eyes, my attitude is, what can I do for you? Whoever, family, community, world. So this is Karma Yoga. Let me quickly go through some of the... Uh, Jayant, do you have people oh, who yes. want to ask something? Uh, yes, Mara. Uh, Rambeji, you are next. Yes, uh, Swamiji, so this was a question more about that uh, 2 cross 2 matrix that you talked about. Hmm. So there actually, what is... Today, not my Prakriti may be my Prakriti tomorrow, right? Like maybe with the experiences and evolving personality, sadhana, whatever. Yes. So Swadharma is not like fixed in stone. I mean, no. It, it is... It's dynamic. And in fact, one must change it. One must change it. Encourage the positive spiritual aspects and bring under control that which is um, uh, worldly. So what is the line that differentiates one from the other to say, okay, maybe today I'm not ready for something and a few days or months or whatever down the lane. You will see, you will see. What, what, what we would try to do is the four yogas, devotion, meditation, seva and inquiry, vichara. These are the four things that we do. Jnana yoga, bhakti yoga, karma yoga, raja yoga. As we do it, you will see some things seem mechanical and lifeless. The other things seem appealing to you. So that is more your prakriti. Some are by nature, they like Vedanta Vichara by nature. Some are active and dynamic. They want to do um, good to others. And it seems alive. Some are by nature very devotional, full of bhakti for, for God. It comes easily to them. So do those. And as you said, keep the other ones also. That's what Swami Vivekananda's teaching was, the harmony of four yogas. 
it is not the fault of the other yogas that uh, it does not appeal to me, it is the fault of my prakriti. Uh, yogas are all excellent. So as I keep on doing the yogas, even if they are little um, mechanical or lifeless for me at present, I will, I am slowly changing my prakriti and getting ready to, um, you know, to do that. They will become alive for me as my prakriti changes. Yes. Pranam Maharaj, um, I'm sorry we missed the initial part of your discussion on Swadharma, but coming back to the topic, uh, can you comment something about the Swadharma of um, a working mother with young kids, mm. like something that's apparently at loggerheads with each other, how to deal with that? No, the, as I said, Swadharma includes your the role that you're playing. Uh, remember the five components which I talked about. Um, one of the components was the asadharan dharma, that means the unique role that you have. So just like I mentioned my own example, I, I took charge of a college and I was not willing to take the responsibility of being the principal. Similarly, so you have a, a, a young mother who is working, has a career and has got kids, a very tough role to play because there are enormous demands on your time and energy. Now, both you have accepted. If you are working in a job, there is a responsibility that you have taken up. And you are a mother, that is a responsibility that you have taken up. And both you must, you must do to the best of your ability as far as possible. Is it possible? It is possible. It will be a compromise. In both cases a compromise. You see, I used to find this a lot in India. Uh, I was, when I was the principal of a college, so I had interaction with uh, other professors and um, you know, different colleges in Calcutta. Often the ladies who were uh, teachers, they had this dilemma again and again, again. Generally, the husbands don't have this dilemma. If they do something in the house, they are praised for it. That, oh, see how good and helpful he is. But the ladies, they have to do both. They have to look after their career and be good in that and uh, come back home and do all the work, take care of the kids and the kitchen and whatever. And people will say, yeah, that's just her job. So, <laughs> uh, it's really difficult. And also, I noticed uh, women also have a little more than men, I think, have a sense of guilt. Uh, they always feel they are not good enough, somehow not doing enough. I don't, uh, men in general, they think they are doing enough and more than enough. They generally, it comes so in, uh, relaxed and so easy, you know. So, yeah. The one thing I used to tell them was that whatever you are doing, um, both are good, both are part of your dharma. So, don't have regrets about it. If you are in the midst of a career and you have to take care of kids also, yes, it will be a compromise. So what? Don't, don't re regret it. And uh, uh, go ahead and do it to the best of your ability. If there are some who gave up their job and career to look after the kids, so there also I told them, there also don't regret it. Own up to the fact that you took a decision to stop working and look after the kids. Afterwards, what happens is, 10, 20 years later, uh, sit down and grumble that the husband and the kids, nobody is giving you credit. I sacrificed so much for you and nobody. No, don't say that also. There also you are saying that uh, they should now give me credit for it and nobody is giving me cre credit for what I did. No, I took the decision. It is, my, it is the role that I took up consciously and I took the decision that I will give up the job and look after the kids and that's what I did. I have no regrets about it. Or, I did the job and looked after the kids as far as possible. I have no regrets about that also. Karma Yoga is doing all of that as a service to the Lord. You see, the joy comes when you see this body, this mind, Stula Sharira, Sukshma Sharira. These do not belong to me. The Lord has given these and I am using it in the service of the Lord. As long as we appropriate to ourselves a part of samsara, this is mine. And this what is going on inside is mine. Now I will use them for my own satisfaction. There is no happiness there. The Lord, you have given me this job, this samsara and the means to take care of it. Let me offer the, what is Lord's in the, uh, to, the, to what is Lord's. And there is a saying in Bengali, Ganga Jale Ganga Puja. So, Ganga, the river Ganga is there. How do you worship? Every puja you offer Ganga water. But to, to Ganga when you are offering worship, what will you offer? You will offer Ganga water. Similarly, to Lord Samsara, whenever you are offering worship through Karma Yoga, 
we are uh, 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 offering worship with this body and mind which is also part of the Lord Samsara. I take no ownership of it. That is the central thing. I watch, uh, I am the, at the level of the physical body, I am doing all the actions, house, community, office, my career. At the level of the mind, well-wisher, husband, children, colleagues, I am a well-wisher, let me see what I can do, what can I do for you. When you have that attitude, there is freedom and peace of mind. And at the end of the day, and at the end of the career, end of the family life, at the end of our own physical life also, there will be peace, joy, and freedom. Hmm. Maharaj, can I ask a question? Yes. So, um, in workplace, when there are like conflicts, and in, you know, if you are the person who is supposed to take a decision, uh, and you, you know, make judgments to the best of your ability. And when the repercussions come, like, you know, you don't really respond to that and you see that as expected and you just kind of offer that to the Lord also. One of the issues I encounter is that when I look at my own reaction, say, okay, fine, I'm not react to it, reacting to it. Now, does that have a tendency of growing into a spiritual ego that, oh, so there is this, you know, like blowback, but it, it does not affect me because I have offered, like, you under, you know. Yes, whether, there, there is. There is, but don't overthink it. <laughs> uh, don't overthink it. Don't uh, agonize over it unnecessarily. But well, you are pointed to something important. In Karma Yoga, forgiveness is very important. Um, as we continuously practice forgiveness towards others, we also earn forgiveness for ourselves. This is part of the Lord's prayer in Christianity. So important. It's foundational to Christianity. That uh, you continuously for, uh, forgive where you think people are hurting you, misbehaving against you. Mentally forgive. Externally, depending on the situation, you may have to be firm, you may have to be assertive, or you may ignore it, but mentally keep on forgiving. If necessary, ask for forgiveness. Whether the other person forgives or not, that does not matter. God forgives. That is foundational for Karma Yoga. You cannot hold on to grudges and then practice karma yoga. Yes, that's a good point. Anybody else or we'll end the class? We have, as usual, gone well over time. Yeah. Poonam ji. Huh? There are two questions, Mara. Yes. Uh, Lisa, you're next. Hi. Okay, great. So, um, going back to Duryodhana a little bit, because I love the characters in the Mahabharata because they're so complex and yes. rich and there's not just a good guy and a bad guy. Everybody's got their things, you know. How much of Dury Donna's personality is because of his karma? Like, is it his karma who's making his, to him do some kind of things like this? And also genetics, maybe, because he's got Shakuni, who he's related to, like, egging him on. And is Shakuni just, you know, does, does Shakuni know the difference between right and wrong? Or is he also just, you know, stoking, is he just stoking the fire to get what he wants? Right. Um, you have a huge project which you have to undertake, and I know that uh, about the uh, the musical. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so the first point, as you said, that's uh, very important about the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, especially the Mahabharata, where all these texts, Gita or the Upanishads or the other Advaitic texts, they seem so neat and geometrical when you read them, but life is messy. So, when you actually implement it in life and you come into contact with others, it's not at all so clear-cut. Neither the practices, nor the results, nor the characters, they are, everything is complex. And that's why the Mahabharata is interesting. Uh, on purpose, even the most ideal characters, things which look like defects have been introduced into them. Even the most uh, villainous characters, things which look like virtues have been introduced into them. So, yes. Uh, there is nature and nurture in both of them. Um, one insight I'll share here. The karma, the desire which propels all of this is, um, is not because of our genetics or even because of our, uh, the nature which has come through many lifetimes. Now here immediately you will say, but didn't you say all the likes and aversions 
likes and dislikes, they boil up from within because of the conditioning of past lives and this life. Yes, here's the point. What Krishna is driving at here, and he said it earlier also, the desire, you know, the passion or the anger or the greed or the hatred that may boil up from within because of my conditioning, the, uh, that, that'll come up. The next moment is open to us. For the briefest of moments, there is a window of decision making and opportunity that is open to, to us. If we play that right, then our destiny and life takes us Godward. If we don't seize that moment, then what is programmed into us, that plays out. And that will also take, make us spiritual, but over time, through a lot of suffering, through a lot of evolution, everybody is going to realize God, even Duryodhana, even Shakuni. Um, ultimately, enlightenment is there for everybody. But the, the suffering, so in Vivekananda, sort of half humorously, he said, take your time. You have infinite time before you. But it's only half humorous because it's not a pleasant thing to cons consider that many lifetimes we may be whirled around. Uh, so that, the, the precise answer to your question is the desire, the karma which arises and its products, greed or anger, they arise because of our conditioning, both genetics uh, and the influence of the world around us and also the dispositions we have brought as baggage from many lifetimes. So they arise. That's true. But at that moment, whether to nurture them, nourish them, hold on to them and then express it as speech and action or not, or to replace it with something which we have learned now, we have studied, we have learned, we have aspired towards uh, peace of mind, enlightenment and light, um, that we have freedom. We have so freedom. So that's like our, um, our free will. We have the choice exactly. Exactly. what comes into play. Yes, yes. It's like a test all the time, it seems like, right? Uh, I can put it that way, or you can say that we, it's a power, the power of decision making. It's like a superpower you have to completely change your life, even in the tiniest way, but that power you have when? All the time. All the time you've got that power. Even if I don't exercise it now, the next moment when I do it, I have it. Yeah. Is that Viveka? Viveka shows me the difference between what I should do and what I should not do. And then the decision. I will do this. Uh, yes, it's born of Viveka. Without Viveka, we will not know what to do and what not to do. Right. Very good. On that note, let us con conclude today. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ramakrishna Rupanamastu Very good. Let me see all of you. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Stay safe. Take care. Jai Ramakrishna. Jai Ramakrishna. Oh, I can see Vasu. And who is that with Vasu? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Swamiji. Thank you. Take care. Oh, Rinidhi is also there. <laughs> no, Shkar. Take care. Take care. Hi, Swamiji. Thank you. Stay safe. Namaskar. Namaskar. Stay safe. Stay safe.